Uh, hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Mahmoud Charara, uh, Institute State University Extension and Research Education. Um, I'll talk to you today about sludge and lagoon maintenance and the ABCs, really, to set up the talk for our, uh, the rest of our presentations today. Uh, the overview of my presentations would really be to answer a set of questions. What is sludge? Why clean out the sludge? And how do we measure and remove the sludge? And uh, all the considerations going into planning the clean out to ensure it's uh, the integrity of the structure and an economic process. And finally, some of the research work we are doing, I'll briefly touch on that, and the potential for alternative uses for the sludge recovered. Now sludge, uh, many of us might not be familiar, it is a residue of a lot of the manure and the treatment process for our uh, uh, manure generated on farm. It is typically lower on organic matter, mainly because it has already gone through an anaerobic treatment step in our lagoons or in our digesters. It is typically denser and heavier and contains higher metals. And that's typically why it settles and connects, collects at the bottom of storage structures. It is a uh, very low odor and surprises a lot of, uh, of us who works with this material. Um, and um, as you can see here in this figure, adapted from the NRCS design standard. Typically, uh, there is a designated volume uh, that is um, uh, sized to accumulate that sludge with the intention of cleaning it out over longer periods of time. Now, with that in mind, why do we care to clean the sludge that accumulates in lagoons or in digesters? Mainly because it really interferes with the primary function of our structure, which is the treatment. As you can see on the right hand side, a lot of these structures are designed to provide a treatment. Most of this treatment takes place with the microbial communities in the lagoon or in the digester. And when these solid residues in the sludge accumulate over time, they take over volume that was otherwise occupied by our micro microbial communities. And what that does is reduces uh, the potential to carry the so solids or the organics to all the intermediate steps to get it to the simplest form that we are familiar with, whether it's methane, carbon dioxide, or ammonia. So as you are shortening the volume or reducing that volume, you do not have the complete treatment available, which can result in an incomplete treatment. So you're increasing these volatile fatty acids emitting uh, from the, the lagoons or an incomplete digestion in a case of an anaerobic digester. That can show itself in uh, impacts in air quality uh, or reduced biomethane production. Uh, we see increased odor emissions, especially if we are in the Southeast recycling a lot of that effluent into flushing the barns can potentially increase pathogens or uh, impact animal performance. We can also notice that as an increase in the concentration of nutrients being irrigated from that structure. Again, I'm going back to the lagoons common here in the Southeast United States where the concentration of nutrients in that sludge will impact the liquid above it. And we'll start to see that we are irrigating higher nutrient liquid. And for digesters, we see that the minerals in the sludge in particular, copper and zinc, can have a negative impact on the microbial communities we need to create the methane. So many studies have looked at and determined that with the increase in copper and zinc in the liquid, we actually start to see a reduction in the biogas production. So these are really a lot of the reasons of why we clean out the sludge. We measure sludge in typically two ways. The first way is to actually survey, which means to determine the depth to the sludge in order to determine its volume in our structure. Uh, it's much easier if we have an open lagoon, as you can see in this picture, you see a weighted plate. And it's typically the method here is to determine depth all the way to the bottom, which is the liner and then use a weighted disc to determine the depth where it settles on top of the sludge layer. Alternatively, there is a sludge judge, which is a commercial product that is essentially a large straw to collect a complete column of the lagoon and retrieve it. And using visual uh, observation, you can determine the transition from a liquid to a sludge phase. Or more recently, we are seeing uh, a lot of acoustic tools that we can use to determine the depth to sludge. Notice here on the top of this, I was surveying uh, the depth of sludge under the covered lagoon. And uh, this is possible with a lot of these sonars. So that's really an opportunity. 
uh, as well as fish finders, or as you can see on the moving video here in the lower right corner, that's actually a remote control boat with a sonar on board that can move across the lagoon to survey it and determine the length of the column of liquid to get to the sludge. More information about these methods and this fact sheet and in the link you will see in the handouts. So now that we've determined the amount of sludge that we have in the lagoon or the structure, uh, we, our goal is really to determine what is the concentration of nutrients to really develop a, a plan, a complete plan for this. And there is a whole variety of samplers that are out there. Uh, one of them is the clamshell sampler you're seeing, which is a spring-loaded sampler that can be lowered and then triggered to grab a, a bottom sample of the sludge. Also, these sludge, sample, uh, sludge judges could also double as a samplers of the sludge itself, where that column can be sampled and transferred into a container or a bucket for analysis that would require a larger diameter or some of the samplers that are custom made and depending on, on the need. So for instance, here, this is a sampler we have developed here at State and we have used it to collect a complete profile of a lagoon, including the top liquid and the sludge. And then we are transferring it in segments into sampling uh, for analysis. And we actually have in the handouts that you will see both a link to a video for the incomplete sampling using that sampler on the right-hand side as well as all of the different options that you have to sample sludge from a, an open storage structure. Now, using those two pieces of information, the volume of sludge and the, concentrate, the nutrients or the content of uh, solids, you can start to develop plans for the sludge utilization. Now, what you're seeing on the screen right now is a, the product of a boat, the remote control boats that have scanned a lagoon structure and the color represents the depth to that sludge. So the lighter color is a deeper areas, whereas the darker color represent um, a shallow uh, distance, which means larger sludge accumulation. And many of us with, with experience in this area will understand that we always notice there is a part of the structure where a lot of these sediments collect. Um, now, on the right hand side, you see this is actually the result of us collecting this complete sample of the lagoon foot by foot and determining the solids in these samples. So with those two, we can determine, uh, and we've used that to determine at what depth is the, the sonar indicating the sludge presence. And then we're looking at the foot by foot solids. Here, if you see on the horizontal axis, this is the concentration of solids from zero all the way to 20 and 30%. And this is the depth. As you move downward, you are moving deeper in the lagoon. So around the eight foot mark where we see indicated here, that represents about 6% um, uh, solids. And that typically the range six to 8% is what triggers sonars um, to indicate that is the depth uh, to sludge. Now that we know how much sludge and what's in the sludge, how do we remove it? Uh, commonly, we rely on uh, PTO power pumps, as you can see on the slide here, uh, pump agitating the lagoon or the structure and connect collecting the suspended slurry into a hauler, manure hauler or a tanker to take it for land application in fields. That's the most common approach that we use. And as you can see, this is one of the a critical piece of uh, a critical process that requires a, a trained operator. Uh, to make sure that the integrity of the equipment, but also the integrity of the uh, uh, berms for these lagoons. Uh, a variation on it would be a floating uh, pumping uh, setup to where um, the actual apparatus can, we can deploy the pump at different points in the lagoon that might not be accessible to our typical uh, traditional uh, uh, slurry pumps. Occasionally, and we see that more here, uh, down east is where we actually use a dredging uh, setup um, to resuspend the solids or collect the sludge directly from the bottom and pump it out to where it is treated with a polymer and then introduced uh, to a dewatering bag, as you can see here, to leach out the free water and create a solid product, a sludge material that could later be recovered from these bags and land applied or spread, as you can see here. 
uh, it's a more involved process as you can see in this figure, but can typically be used um, in areas like our areas down here in the Southeast when we don't have a lot of acres near our farms. And we always notice that the acres around our farms are already uh, doing well in nutrients and, and uh, doesn't really need a lot of the high phosphorus, zinc and copper we typically see in these materials, which means that a sludge oftentimes is having to travel longer distances, uh, especially here. Occasionally we see more and more excavators being used. Uh, typically excavators are used when we are decommissioning the structure or the digester, but more and more we are seeing interest in using them to recover high solids directly from the lagoon without having to add a polymer to the water. So there is a lot of growing interest in this as a, a process for removing sludge. Now, when we move into a covered structure and I'm using the covered lagoon as an example, this is one of the areas where we start to see challenges. The accessibility of the sludge is the primary barrier we see. And we have seen over the years and we'll see during the, the talks afterwards, different approaches on how to do this. Uh, generally, uh, before adding the covers in, in, in lagoons or covered digesters, uh, installing sub, uh, submerged lines with ports to allow for uh, pumping out this material is important and adding them at uniform distances allows this flexibility later on or installing the plumbing at different points where a suspension uh, pumping High horsepower pumping, of course, would be required to create a slurrying of the digester before uh, pumping out uh, of that sludge. Or if both fail, is the actual part partial or a complete removal of the cover to recover the sludge similar to what we have seen um, in the previous um, open lagoons. Um, I'll talk to you briefly about uh, some work we have done over the last year to actually look into, can we use some of these equipment? And you can see here a remote controlled agitation boat that is familiar as part of the uh, sludge removal technologies to see whether just running that agitator on a lagoon might actually help to reduce the volume of the sludge. And that's based on anecdotal uh, comments by many that this could actually increase the microbial activity and somehow reduce sludge. So to answer this question, we set out to sample a lagoon before uh, we deployed these agitators. Uh, and then we went in two months later to sample and we are due for a one year later um, to sample. What I'll show you today is what we have seen before uh, um, the agitation, which is the blue line that connects what is the total solids with the depth of that sample. So as you can see, as we go deeper in the lagoon, the solid content increases, and that's the blue line. After we agitated, we've noticed a shift that happened, which is the red line here. That shift is mainly a lot of the solids in the bottom of the lagoon decreased and moved upward. So we actually, that suspension moved the solids upwards. But really when we did a complete accounting of the solids, we did not notice any change in the concentration of the solids as a total in the storage structure. In the same way, when we tracked carbon concentration across the lagoon, as we are going deeper in the lagoon, you can see the carbon concentration is increasing until we hit that active treatment layer and then start decreasing again as we are entering the uh, sludge accumulation area where the material that have been degraded is accumulating. Not a whole lot of difference between the two. Now, as we are looking through um, choosing different strategies on how to remove sludges and more uh, closely when we are talking about lagoons, the question of the method and the cost involved. So as I indicated to you all, um, if you need to move the sludge a longer distance, you're probably having to remove it uh, with less water content because it will have to go on wheels for a longer distance, which means that the watering is probably your better option and excavation and finally potentially pumping it. And we know that these are in order of cost. A dewatering process makes the whole sludge removal costly, more so than excavators with pumping is the least cost. Uh, we know that the mix of the solids that we need to move and the travel distance all have an impact of, with the methods that we choose. Um, in this slide here, I wanted to show you how the 
concentration of solids in the sludge that is being removed can impact the cost of the removal itself. As in North Carolina here, we our producers are required to remove sludge when it encroaches on the treatment volume at a certain set point, which is 50% of the treatment volume. So you see here for a given lagoon, if that sludge has been removed at a 10% solid or 8% or 6% or 4%. And you can see the cost increases as you're removing it at, with, as a thinner slurry, mainly because you are having to move more gallons of manure or of slurry in order to remove the same amount of solids. So that's really where it pays off to actually use um, effective mixing and suspension to remove that sludge. And that could almost be uh, half the cost between the 10% solids and the 4% solids. The other point to take into consideration here is the effect of distance. As we increase the distance, we pay more, but not as much as the amount, the impact of concentration of solids. Um, some points to keep in mind here is the, uh, as we've known the volume and what we need to remove to keep in compliance. It's important to keep in mind that, and that's an example for swine in particular, showing the concentration of nutrients in the manure as we typically manage it in the Midwest, compared to what we see in our lagoon systems in the Southeast, where part of it is the liquid part, which is very low in nutrients, and then the sludge, which is very enriched in uh, phosphorus, uh, zinc, and copper. So that's a very important consideration when we are planning the land application. Even if we are nitrogen-based or phosphorus-based, we have to keep an eye on the zinc and copper. That's really one of the drivers for us down here in the Southeast to start to look into alternative technologies or strategies to use that sludge away from just land applying it, especially since we have limited acreage. Uh, there's a lot of interesting work I, I do not have space to present it to you today, but to many of you that will be attending the Waste to Worth, we'll be presenting a lot of the research of what we are doing on integrating that sludge into composting recipes and using sol solar greenhouse structures to dry it and then to take it to a granular form that could be distributed or marketed. So to sort of to sum up, sludge is an unavoidable part of the manure treatment. Monitoring and removal is very critical to ensure the digester and lagoon performance. The method of removal depends on the type of structure we have. Important to plan for zinc and copper and phosphorus as well to avoid any stresses for crops and soil integrity. And finally, the dewatering, composting, and potentially drying are all potential technologies that we have in our arsenal. And we are working to, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to share with you uh, more data in the near future. I want to thank you all and don't hesitate to reach out with any questions.